Okay, and now we are recording. And okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, so good evening again, and, and thank you all for coming to the, the final night of our inaugural Green Home Tour. Um, this is a program that we began planning more than two years ago, and now we're into the fourth and final leg of our four-part series. Um, if you weren't able to catch any of our, our previous screen home tours of the last three Mondays, we will have all of those recorded um, and available to you on our website. And we'll be sending out an email to everybody and a newsletter with all that information. Um, we'll also have a, a, a green home tour resource guide that we'll provide to you again on our website. And it'll just be a recap of each of the four nights, have all the resources from each of the homes, and that'll be available to you for download on our website. Um, just like the resource guide and the videos on our website, this program is really meant to be an important sustainability resource for, for you and for the community. Um, all of the homeowners and renters that we've spoken to over the last four weeks have spent countless hours, a lot of time, really um, looking at how they can live more sustainably. And so we're, we're hoping that, that this conversation, this dialogue with them provides an opportunity for you to, to learn one or two or three more steps that you can take to live more sustainability or sustainably at home. Um, tonight's been made possible from, by some really amazing sponsors, including Southern California Edison, Energy Upgrade California, Lewis Management Group, and Carol Holder and John Mellencrop. And it's it really only because of them that we were able to offer all of these for free and that we were able to do the videos and all the great things that we were able to, to put together over the last four weeks. So a big thank you um, to our sponsors. Tonight's a little bit different from the, the previous three nights that we've done. Those nights we focus on a homeowner and what they've done at their house. Tonight we're focusing on renters who make up 35% uh, or more of Americans and who don't own their homes. So we wanna make sure that we're, we're reaching everybody in the community and that despite not owning your home, there's still a lot of things that you can do at home to make an impact. So whether it's you know, behavior change, consumption habits, um, how you eat, how you garden, how you work with the community, all those things really add up to have a, a big impact. And so we, we wanted to hone in on those um, things today. So, just like last week and the weeks before, we're going to start tonight out with a, a brief video tour of a renter, myself, and then of a community garden and community composting program. Um, the conversation is going to be myself, my colleague, Angela Oakley, who's been with us the last three weeks, uh, Elise Roberts, one of our board members here at Sustainable Claremont, Nicole Lang, our Green Crew Program Manager, and Jean Boutoulier, um, from Pilgrim Place and Alex Garibay, who's from Southern California Edison, and who's gonna be able to provide us with some tips and tricks for, for living more efficiently. Um, just like all of the other nights, this really is an opportunity for you, the audience, to ask questions. So during the video or during our conversations, if anything comes up, if you have any questions, drop them into the chat box or press the little raise hand button on the Zoom. Um, and we'll try to get to everybody's questions. We've, we've luckily been able to, to reach all the questions over the past few nights, and we, we hope to get to everyone's questions today. If we don't, for some reason, we'll compile those questions and get them answered for you, and then we'll send a follow-up email to everybody. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started, and we're gonna start off, like all of the nights, with our video. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Can you see that, Angela? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay. There we go. So I'm a renter here in Laverne, and we've rented this home for almost five years now. It's a 1920s, 1930s kind of craftsman style home. And we've always been renters. And we've always sort of struggled with the, the types of things that we could do as renters while still wanting to live sustainably. So some of the major challenges that we have here, or just more generally as renters, is that we just don't have a lot of control over the things that we inherit in the homes. Um, so for instance, we have like a gas stove, gas oven, um, and, and gas heater in the house. We would love to, to switch to electric appliances, but 
um, those aren't our appliances and we're not going to invest in um, uh, new, new appliances for our, our landlord. One of the other major challenges that we have is that, of course, we, we can't add solar, rooftop solar to our home. So despite all of these, these challenges that us renters face um, when we want to live more sustainably, there's still a lot of opportunities that we have and some behavior changes that we can make um, that might seem small, but that can add up to have a, a big impact. Okay, so one of the things that we can all do, uh, whether we're renters or if we live in senior communities um, or if we live in dorms, is that we could change our behavior to live more sustainably. One way is by changing our thermostat so that our AC and our heating isn't on so much. We could be cognizant of the time of use for our appliances, so making sure we're not running our washing machine or dryer only at certain hours, so like in the morning or you know maybe at night after a certain period of time, uh, when the energy demand is, is not too high, so that decreases your electricity bill and it also takes off demand from you know, the greater electricity source. And other small, you know, actions like turning the lights off when you leave the bedroom, using LED light bulbs, all those little small things really do add up to have a imp big impact. So one of the things that you, you can do, potentially if you're a renter, is you can still compost at home. Here I have like the most simple possible setup for composting. It's not intrusive to the yard or anything, so you don't have to worry about that as a renter. Super simple, I've got one active pile right here. I come out daily to, to drop out our food scraps, just cover it with, with grass clippings and, and horse bedding if I have it. Um, and the one here, this is one that's curing. This is one that I stopped using in February. Once you get a pile going for a certain amount of time, you wanna, you wanna stop adding to it and, and let it just sit and, and it'll turn the soil magically. That pile looked like this pile before I, I left it alone. So this is the soil that came from all of the food scrap and I'll, I'll add this back into the raised bed garden. I've not heard anything negative from my landlord who's seen it multiple times, but you should probably ask is, is garden. And you could do it like I have by installing a raised bed garden. This is a pretty simple setup. This is what we built for our first sustainable Claremont raised bed garden program. This was like our prototype to figure things out. We're really serious here about growing food that we're really gonna eat instead of just growing food that ends up in the compost pile. So all I grow is like, I have a couple hundred carrots and then lettuce and arugula. And so we always have salad ready. Um, and then we always make sure to harvest our lettuce on a regular basis. My arugula has gone a little far and started flowering. So it's kind of super peppery and bitter now, but it's still really good. So this one was built by Romeo Lodia, who is our, our community compost program manager. And he's helped us start this new program where we build school gardens, we build raised beds for people's homes. Um, and it's pretty simple. So it's two and a half feet wide, it's eight feet long. And this one's 11 inches high. The, the soil is high quality, like organic soil. In the future, we're trying to use the soil that we create at our community compost program. So it's all sort of locally grown. Um, locally produced soil. Uh, so just one more thing that's really sustainable, especially as renters, you know, try to tick all those boxes when we can. So we've talked about some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that, that renters face. Um, and we also wanted to discuss how, you know, certain types of sustainability actions that we can take, not just as renters or as homeowners, but as a community that are greater than we could do on our own. And so the one we're gonna be talking about tonight is community gardening. Hey, I'm Gene Boutelier. I'm the 2021 moderator of the Resident Association here at Pilgrim Place. I'm Mary Johnson, uh, a resident here um, who loves the earth and loves to get involved with it in gardens and environmental concerns. I honestly don't know who started it. It's been going on for quite a long time. And we recently put in these higher raised beds made from uh, recycled materials. And uh, that's made it more accessible to more people. And I think originally it was started as more a recreational activity, but people enjoy growing food for their own use. And we have a, uh, a sale we call mini sale. It used to be weekly. If we have extra produce, we bring it over to our dining hall and people uh, purchase it and the um, proceeds from that go to our fund that helps our residents. 
This garden we're in now is one of a, several gardens on campus and a, a, and a beautiful greenhouse. You can see that this is the backyard of a skilled nursing center. And one of the things that happens here is that this is a luscious place for people uh, who are living in, a, in skilled nursing to come easily out wheelchairs or whatever and enjoy this part of nature. So it has that extra purpose that we love. The Plant and Produce Committee is actually part of our festival organization because this retirement community has been sponsoring a festival for the community for now 77 years. And, and we will have a big one this year in November 12 and 13. And plants are among the things that we propagate and, and sell to each other and to the public. And um, many people have traditionally come to that. This is one of the places where composting takes place on, 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 on campus, uh, where the uh, kitchen wastes from um, many of our homes and uh, some from the facilities uh, and the grass cuttings and other organic material gradually turns into a good new soil. There are people who are expert at composting and teaching it and people are encouraged to have in their own kitchen a, a container for organic waste and uh, keeping it out of the trash is a community-wide project. We don't own this land. Uh, it's owned by a, a nonprofit, but we farm it and we live in it and we're doing our best and uh, we have the freedom uh, to uh, grow things in our yards, uh, to be careful about what kinds of plants we use, um, and uh, to do sustainable things in, 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 as a community and as individual uh, renters in, in Pilgrim Place. We gar do the gardening just as one part of sustainability. Another part is that we've worked hard collectively on energy reduction. We've got a couple of thousand solar panels up with more to come. We've retrofitted for energy efficiency uh, over a hundred of our dwelling units and our main buildings. Uh, some of the new main buildings are LEED certified for uh, energy use. We're gradually replacing the lawns of the 50s and 40s uh, with the right kind of yards for this climate. We're doing that at a steady pace. Uh, it takes time, costs money to install, but we're moving on it with several being done this year, several next year, where yards are, are turning from uh, lawn to something more sustainable. We all grew up with certain ideas of what gardens should be and even in a very progressive community. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people think a lawn is more attractive than having the native plants here. So it's, a, it's an education process. And when people realize the benefits of it, then they're, they're with it and it, it can be gorgeous. So and we use this area to propagate succulents and other other plants. This area we call the shade house, where it's not glassed in, but a little bit of shade to get things started, and then they're put out or either sold at festival or residents buy them again. Um, proceeds going to that one fund. Mary was talking about uh, why we sell things at festival. The money that we raise uh, at festival goes to a fund which makes sure that when residents who tend to live longer than the actuarial tables would uh, guess, uh, if residents run out of money, they've never had to leave this place because we then take care of each other uh, using the resident health and support program uh, funding uh, which comes from our guest rooms and our festival and from donations which residents make. So all of this helps to make sure that the community takes care of its own. This is a whole other garden that uh, is like the first one is kept by volunteers who uh, ask for plots and grow what they want, share it with their friends or their family. A whole new operation uh, like the one in the Plymouth Garden uh, for composting. Composting is expanding on the campus and we're uh, trying to do it industrial size for our uh, uh, meal service operations uh, as well as uh, tiny size in people's apartments and 
that's, that's an expanding part of the program. Another thing that's expanding here is advocacy on uh, environmental issues, uh, climate change lobby and uh, other projects like that, advocacy work. Uh, people are, even when we're old and having trouble moving around, we can still write letters and make phone calls. And that's an active part of environmental concerns on this campus. We need to take care of each other because we're old. And so uh, sometimes uh, you reach out to each other. We have health advocates here who take each other to the doctors and pay careful attention. Sometimes we need to help each other with, with projects. Uh, but um, everyone doing what they can helps keep them healthy and alive and, and uh, engaged. And gardening is one of the best ways to do that, isn't it? Okay, sorry for that slow transition. All right, great. So um, the the trajectory of our conversation tonight is going to follow a bit the the same that we saw in um, in the video. So we'll start with a, a conversation um, between myself and Angela and Nicole and Elise a bit about like the the challenges of being a renter, um, some sort of the unique challenges that we face and, and some of the opportunities too that, that are presented to us um, by the community that we live in and by you know, just actions that we can take. Um, and then we'll, we'll transition um, and speak with Jean about some of the great things that they're doing at Pilgrim and then move on, like we said, uh, to talk with Alex. Um, so just to kick things off, um, Nicole, I'm gonna start with you. Nicole Lang is our Green Crew Program Manager and she's like, probably one, one of the most sustainably minded people I know and as thoughtful as anybody I know when it comes to um, changing behavior to live more sustainably um, and as a renter. So Nicole, maybe can you start us out with some, you know, when you think about living, you know, in a rental unit and sharing a home with somebody, what are some of the things that, that like immediate challenges that you face? Oh, Nicole, we can't hear you. It's better, yeah. Hopefully the birds and stuff aren't too noisy. Um, yeah, so definitely store everything that you said in the video. Um, and it's a little quiet. Yeah, it's still. Okay, what do you want now? Do you want us to come right back to you, Nicole? Maybe. Am I too loud? That's okay. We'll we'll go to Elise and we'll come back to you, Nicole. Okay. All right, Elise, you're in, you're in the hot seat now. <laughs> All right, Elise, so you and your, your family, you, you are renters here in Claremont. Can you tell us about the same kind of question, some of the, the unique challenges that you face and how you kind of succumb or, you know, overcome those? Yeah, um, so we, we live here in Claremont and we love it so much. And uh, like Stuart said in the video, we don't get to make uh, a lot of decisions for ourselves when it comes to uh, some of the bigger decisions. For example, our uh, complex does not recycle. So um, we had to uh, look into recycling um, alternatives or solutions rather. Um, and luckily the city of Claremont has a residential recycling center. I'm gonna pop the link in here in the chat um, that has been uh, just wonderful for us. Um, it's an extra step and it's so easy to do. <laughs> it's not a big deal. Um, similar thing that's an extra step um, is uh, like Stuart, we also compost, but we compost through the Sustainable Claremont compost program, which is how I heard about Sustainable Claremont and now I'm a board member. Um, so um, I really wanted to compost here, but we live in a condo and don't have a lot of room. We do have a raised bed here as well, but that's pretty much the only add-on that we could have. So uh, the Sustainable Claremont um, Compost Program is a great solution um, for a very, very small fee. Um, we get a orange uh, Home Depot bucket. 
Uh, and we just put all of our food scraps in there for the week. And then when I go take in the recycling, I also take in my compost to, um, to the recycle or the compost center that Sustainable Claremont sets up. Uh, and I get to take dirt back for uh, my raised bed garden at home. So it's just a win-win situation. Um, I will also, um, I hope it's okay that I'm popping links in here uh, into the chat. Absolutely. But um, here is um, the link to learn more about uh, the Sustainable uh, Claremont Compost Program. Um, there are other things that we do, like Stuart said, um, I mean, despite the fact that we have, we also have gas appliances, we limit use, we uh, only use things as often as possible uh, when this is possible, but after, you know, at night is when we run our dishwasher, or do the laundry. Um, we keep our thermostat up pretty uncomfortably high um, because, you know, it's, it's something that we can do. Um, another thing that we do is uh, we're all vegetarians. Uh, that also has a big environmental impact. Uh, I became a vegetarian because of the environmental impacts of meat eating. So I know that that's not, you know, something that is attached to my house, but that's a behavior that I have that um, it makes me feel good and leads to a more sustainable way of life. Another thing kind of on that, um, on that track is we buy or get almost everything secondhand. Like it's kind of like a compulsion at this point where like, I'm like, I, I bet I can get that for free. Uh, and I get, I do this on buy nothing. It's a website. Uh, it's actually on Facebook. There's a super active buy nothing Facebook group uh, here in Claremont, hyper local. I usually walk to get everything, so don't even need to get into your car. Um, and it's just a, um, a bartering economy here that's thriving. Um, and you can ask for things, people post things, you post your own stuff. Um, it's awesome. I'm also gonna post uh, a link uh, in the chat for, um, for By Nothing. They just did a, um, a segment on KCRW about it. So it's like kind of blowing up right now, but <laughs> which is good. Elise, the more people that participate, the better. Is that buy nothing group is, are those specific to certain neighborhoods or cities or how does that work? So if we live in different cities, do each of them have their own? Just look up buy nothing with the name of your neighborhood. Uh, when I first moved to Claremont, there was just one buy nothing group for all of Claremont and it grew so much that it splintered out into smaller groups. So it's hyper, hyper local. I mean, everything is within walking distance um, at this point. So okay, great. it's great. Um, and I can't tell you how much waste I have eliminated, um, both in my, as a consumer, um, you know, I, I'm not buying extra stuff that I don't need. Um, and when I'm done with stuff, I have a toddler. I mean, the things that, you know, even her clothes alone, I mean, she wears them twice and then grows out of them. It feels so good to uh, give perfectly good things a uh, new life. So. That's great. Can, can we take a step back for a second? Um, Please. So you, you mentioned um, the compost program. And I think that this is another one where for a renter, we, you know, we rented the apartment you know, 10 years ago, it's been a little while now. Um, but in the last house we had too, we, we couldn't really have a compost set up. So we looked into like vermiculture as like an alternative, but I can't stand worms. And so I, we didn't want to go that route. And so having like, this as a resource, it, it doesn't have to be just for, for renters. Like I know um, a, a number of uh, participants in the community compost program are people who, who went there to learn how to compost and then it was just easier for them to sign up to the program than to do it at home. <laughs> and it's one of those things where you, you take your bucket and then it, you know, over time it magically turns into to great soil. Do you find that you use the soil or for you, is it mostly like a get rid of the food waste and feel good about it and not use the soil or is it a full circle type of thing for you? It depends on what pro uh, projects I have going on at home. Um, for example, um, again, we, uh, 
we rent and I don't want to spend a lot of money landscaping. So this kind of is like full circle here from everything I just talked about. I really wanted to do something nice in our front yard. So I put a request into buy nothing for uh, some succulents, some plants. Um, Sorrel, who's a fellow board member, also a member of buy nothing, was one of the many people who answered my call and let me come and get succulents and other people let me get plants. And at that point I did um, gather dirt from um, the compost uh, site from Sustainable Claremont. So it just kind of depends. I don't usually use that, but it does make me feel good to be able to compost my food. Just another option, right? right. Yeah. And for the recycling, uh, where is that in Claremont? It's on Monte... Monte Vista. Vista, right next to the, across the street from the Claremont Club. Okay. Okay, that's right at the community services department, right? In that little weird driveway area. Correct. And they're only open Friday through Sunday. So again, like it's just kind of like a weekend thing that we do. We take in our compost and our recycling uh, in the same trip and right. it's super easy. Great. Angela, do you have any questions for Elise or should we check on Nicole's mic? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say uh, as a quick follow-up to the recycling center. They collect, they accept all the same things that we put in our blue bins, right? Correct. So paper, metal, glass, some limited plastics. <laughs> okay, okay. Yep. And um, there's a couple other questions. Um, just to let everybody know, if you type a question in the chat, we might not answer it right away, but we're kind of we're gonna kind of try to collate them and sort of, so we're not just bouncing all around, we, we try our best. And um, so if it takes a while for us to get to you, it's just, we're just trying to coordinate the conversation. So um, if somebody wants to answer quickly in the chat, that's fine, but we still wanna make sure everybody hears and can and be part of the discussion. So we'll also try to talk about it, not just do it all on chat. Um, I think so far we've just had a few questions about um, gardening and Pilgrim Place. So we'll go back to that a little bit later. Okay, great, great. Nicole, can we check in with you? How's your, your microphone set up? Can you hear me on my phone? Yes. Yeah, okay. So okay. much better. <laughs> so yeah, much better. I don't know, that laptop, man. Um, Okay, so yeah, definitely challenges that I have are everything that Stuart mentioned mentioned um, in the video. Um, also, I have the additional hurdle of the fact that I live with housemates. Um, so kind of the obstacle of having to um, mesh and cohabitate with different lifestyles. Um, so I kind of live a very low waste, low consumption um, lifestyle with people who are pretty high waste and high consumption. Um, so I really can only focus on what I can do. Um, and I kind of try to integrate little things here and there. Like I've gotten my housemates to use um, stasher bags, which if anybody doesn't know what that is, that's um, reusable silicone bags that you use instead of Ziplocs. Um, I've gotten them to try almond or oat milk creamer instead of dairy creamer um, and things like that. Um, but it definitely is one of those things where I kind of have to continuously go through the house and turn off lights and just kind of work in different things um, as I can. But yeah, definitely the hurdle of having to mesh with other people is a, is a big one. So when you talk about some of like the, the low consumption um, uh, ways of living, mm -hmm. are you on the same types of like buy nothing groups and, and can you tell a little, a little bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I definitely I am on buy nothing too. It's one of my favorite things. I talked to anybody about it. I was at an estate sale yesterday and I actually convinced somebody uh, to join, join the page. Um, but I think it's really just looking at what you consume as a whole, um, whether that be your energy usage, your gas, your um, food that you eat, um, your clothes, just really looking um, at everything that you're consuming, um, looking at how was the item created, um, were the people who created it treated and paid fairly, um, what's the end of life for items that I purchase, um, 
So like at least to pretty much I'm to the point where I would say like at least 90% of everything that I buy is secondhand. Um, I really try to avoid buying new as much as possible just because there is already so much stuff in the waste stream. So there's definitely stuff that I can pull from from there. Um, also, I do eat plant based, so not entirely vegan, but I would say like about 90% um, is vegan of um, what I eat and pretty much all the meals that I make myself for the most part are vegan. Um, so um, eating plant based also trying to cut down on uh, my food waste I don't really tend to waste food at all because I um, plan my meals out before I go to the farmers market which that also works into that um, buying local supporting local farmers um, so I reduce my food waste by um, like I said by um, planning out my meals um, if I have food that is about to go bad I freeze it so that I can eat it later um, things like that um, I also um, try to walk or bike as much as possible. Um, so there was a challenge that we learned about during our, um, what was it, on during our annual um, gala last year, um, which is a challenge of trying to bike or walk within every, um, every place that is within a mile from your home. Um, so I try to adhere to that. Um, but yeah, those are just uh, lots of different ways. Uh, like I said, when I am purchasing items, I try to buy them secondhand. And if I do have to buy them new, um, then I look at the materials that they're um, created with. For example, I buy um, tissue made from recycled paper or bamboo as opposed to new paper because, you know, we're all about the trees. So we want to save them as much as possible. Um, buying like a bamboo hairbrush as opposed to plastic. Um, I really try to avoid plastic as much as possible using bulk bins. Um, lots of, you can go on this forever as uh, you, as you, Stuart, know, you I, talk I know. about this for a long time. So that's, so this is good. Let good. me, let me jump in. Yeah. So I think one of the things that you mentioned was like food waste and we've talked a little bit about composting already, which is, you know, an important, um, and, you know, place for the, the food scraps to end up, but it's still super important not to waste food, right? We don't want to be yeah. you know, throwing like apples that we just didn't eat in the compost bin, like all that great nutrients and all that water and all that, you know, stuff that, that went in to produce that, those carbon miles on those um, uh, food items is important. So just like kind of thinking about how we, we eat and making sure that we're not throwing things away frivolously. Um, Nicole, one of the, the, the things that you mentioned was um, sort of zero waste or as close to like zero waste as you can get. Um, I think a lot of us when we, you know, struggle, especially during the pandemic with the amount of like plastic that we're getting, you know, if you order takeout, they throw in like four extra forks or whatever in the bat, the plastic bag and like, you could tell them like five times not to do that. But then when, you know, th these things just happen. Um, are there some some places that you like to go in particular that are, are good for, you know, getting food or getting groceries or, or getting, you know, whatever products that are really cater to a zero waste type lifestyle? Um, yeah, I think definitely for the produce shopping local at the farm, farmer's market, if you're able to, um, I typically go to the Pomona one. Also, there's the Claremont one, um, obviously. Um, we also have, I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, that's right by Sustainable Claremont that has produce. What's it called? Uh, Sprouts, Whole Foods? No, the- um, Uncommon like, Good. Yes, yes, yeah, Uncommon Good, good. yes, right. yes. Um, so going to places like that where you can really talk to the people one-on-one -on -one and um, get your produce free of plastic. Um, when I go to the st or traditional store, um, I just try to be cognizant of what I'm getting. So I'll get loose carrots as opposed to the ones in the package. I have um, reusable produce bags that I use. So I'm not using the plastic ones. Um, of course, with the pandemic, it's a lot harder um, just because most bulk bins aren't open right now. Um, but when they are open, then I use those with my reusable bags. Um, also, a good thing to do is to just bring like the brown paper bags so you don't have to use the plastic ones if you don't have reusable ones. Um, and then when it comes to takeout, I usually don't order delivery um, when I go out to eat. If I want to take it out, 
um, and they aren't willing to use my containers um, if I bring them, um, then I will have them put the food on a plate and then I will transfer it to my own container. Um, so that's kind of one way to work around it if you're able to go to, if you have the privilege and your, the ability to go to um, the restaurant in person, that's a way to avoid waste right there. Um, and then, yeah, like you said, when it's, it's so hard because I've worked in food and it's just such a fast paced um, business. So that definitely can be hard. Even if you write a little note requesting no utensils or no napkins or whatever, it's very easy to forget because it's such a, um, such a gut reaction and an instinct to do that. Um, so, but like I said, you can try to put that no. I think another thing that we can all try to do as a community to come together is to urge Claremont and other cities to pass ordinances to where restaurants um, only provide the silverware when it's asked for. Um, so it's not automatically given, um, so that straws aren't automatically given, um, just to kind of also get people to think about the fact that, you know, if you're eating at home, do you really need that plastic fork? You just go in the in your drawer and get your own fork and just pop it in the dishwasher if you have one. Um, so that is definitely, that's one way that we can kind of work together um, as a community to try to lessen our waste as a whole. Are there, I, I like what you said, how, you know, you don't have, like you, you have like the, the bags that you could take to, to Uncommon Good or Sprouts or wherever to put your produce in, but if it's just a brown bag, right, or whatever, mm -hmm. we could use those too. It doesn't require like buying something extra to, yeah. to start your zero waste journey. Yeah, definitely. Use what you have is always the first, the first step. And I mean, for most of my produce, I just throw it in the cart loose. Like, right. I'm going to wash it anyway, so I don't need it. I don't really need a bag most of the time. All right, so <laughs> the, a counter to that. So if you do want to buy some like zero waste stuff, like, you know, there, there are some things, some like durable items that you might want that um, are, are more sustainable or, or zero waste oriented. Are there any good like online sites that you use or local retailers where you get your stuff or, or how do you find that? You just search for it? Um, yeah, typically, I mean, I try to stay away from Amazon as much as possible, just because not only their impact on the environment, but they just don't treat their workers fairly. Um, so I really try to stay away from them as much as possible, maybe order from them like once a year, if that. Um, so there are lots of like, zero waste stores online. There's one called Package Free Shop. Um, if you just literally Google zero waste store, I think there's one actually called zero waste store. Um, quite a lot of them will um, pop up. If you're ever in LA, um, there's a couple there. I should have these handy. I'll drop them in the chat. I'll look them up after we're done and I'll pop a few in there. That's great. And I, I got a question here. Uh, uh, Angelo's probably collating these better than I am, but I just saw this one come up. What about water? You know, we're in such like an extreme drought right now and it's like screaming hot outside like the past few days. Are you able to do things to conserve water as a renter in your situation? Or how do you think about that resource? Um, I do full, super full loads of laundry. I have, before I started to be more low waste, I had a big jug of detergent from Costco. Um, and I do so little laundry that I still have it and it's still half full and I've had it for at least three years. So really doing big loads. Um, course in the summer it's harder because we all get sweaty of course um but when it's in the winter um I try to I wear my clothes multiple times so I wear my jeans maybe four times before I wash them wear a t-shirt a couple times before I wash it because it's not really dirty there's no point in um, washing it um we are lucky enough to have a dishwasher so I try not to wash dishes by hand at all because um, that uses a lot of water um let me see what else um our sprinklers i noticed that our sprinklers were coming on too early um since, yeah. the, since the sun um is setting later um so i didn't want that to be evaporating off so i kind of changed the time to um when it is darker um I'm trying to think what else i think those would probably be the main the main things that i do that's great okay angela um do we have some questions yet that we need to to get to or are we still good um, well, on the subject of laundry, <laughs> there's a little bit of chatter going back and forth about um, laundry detergents, and particularly it started with, sorry, I lost my chat history for a minute there <laughs> when I got uh, booted off, so it didn't keep it all, but um, 
there's a discussion from Jan Bush about jug free laundry sheets and some other people just confident, you know, sharing um, about, or I guess Jan said they're available at, you know, the stores here in town, Stater Brothers and Sprouts, and um, they seem to be uh, working well. So that's one more big chunk of plastic that we might be able to eliminate. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot more of those kinds of things on the market. I know several companies, and if you do a Google search about waste-free um, cleaning products and soaps, there's just a lot more out there. And hopefully that will bring, they'll become the norm in our grocery stores and places that people shop on a regular basis. Um, and um, also uh, some, not so much, I guess there's a question, there's some chat going back and forth about food choices as Nicole and Elise both mentioned. Um, they really do have a, a huge, for any given person, their, it, our food is a big piece of the pie in terms of our, our overall impact. And um, so eating lower on the food chain, eating plant-based, avoiding meat and dairy in particular can really reduce your water consumption. Um, the question was, is Pilgrim Place addressing benefits of plant-based diets? Um, uh, let me respond. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, our model here is not like some senior living places, a perpetual cruise ship. We try to be different from that. Uh, there's 350 of us, and we're absolutely not all in the same place on food choices, but there's been years of advocacy among the residents that has led to the fact that now at every meal, there are both plant-based and vegetarian and plain, uh, meaning no sauce uh, options uh, for each of the, uh, of the, of the meals. The, we have a commercial food service, uh, and we, they were chosen because of a reputation uh, for sustainable sourcing uh, or more, more responsible sourcing, uh, not always sustainable. The pandemic has been terrible for us. The restrictions on congregate living locations uh, has uh, re demanding the use of uh, plastics and so forth has been just dreadful. We've hated it, can't wait to get out of it. We do some, our, our food service does some local sourcing and also occasionally when it can purchases from uh, Uncommon Good uh, for specialty items on our salad bars. Um, and we uh, definitely have advocates for plant-based and for uh, healthy food eating uh, pushing us from among the resident population. There are other, Pilgrim Place residents on the line who may have other uh, answers to that question. That's super helpful. Um, Elise, um, now that we've got Jean right here, it seems like a perfect transition point to, to start talking about the more communal um, type living and, and how we could do more with more of us. So uh, since you met with Jean at the, the Pilgrim Place, I'll let you take it from here. Great. Uh, well, I am just planning on letting Jean talk a little bit about uh, the gardens and the compost that um, that Pilgrim Place has. Uh, it was absolutely incredible to um, to go on a tour with Jean. Uh, the and Mary Johnson. And Mary. Is Mary here? No, not tonight. But we do have Ted Morales here who uh, is the director of our facilities and who uh, knows a great deal about what we've done for water conservation and, uh, and uh, the, the way we work at uh, all of our conservation projects. Great. So, Jean, if you could just tell us a little bit about the gardens and how they came to be and, the, and kind of their purpose, where, where the food goes, who consumes it. Um, the, the first of all, the food that's grown uh, belongs to the people who grew it, so it can be uh, taken home or shared. Some of it is definitely donated. 
uh, to a mini market that we have on the patio outside our food service dining room and uh, people uh, purchase it there uh, uh, to share uh, with, the with the money from the purchase going towards our health and, um, and uh, retaining residents who've run out of money. Um, the, uh, we, we have had uh, expert people among our residents who were uh, working on sustainable agriculture as, as agricultural missionaries uh, and as authors of environmental books um, decades ago uh, that were part of a pioneering movement uh, in religion uh, to begin to emphasize uh, more uh, environmental concerns. And so composting, we've had uh, lessons on composting from residents for decades and have built up the, what you saw on the movie, which was a, a really good um, system for uh, composting. As I said, Ted knows more about a lot of these items than I do, and I'll be glad to bounce to him anytime he wants to help answer a question that anyone asks. Gene, I'm just also trying to set the scene a little bit of Pilgrim Place. In addition to these gardens and the compost, don't you have like over a hundred fruit trees? I mean, it's just, yes. it's absolutely And, and the, the, the fruit trees, um, uh, you know, we don't like to spend extra money on staffing that would build more cost into the living here. And so the, the pruning of the fruit trees and the picking uh, is done by volunteers. Uh, and um, yes, there's over, there's over a thousand, there's a thousand trees on our campus, but a hundred, over a hundred fruit trees. Ted, is that the right number? You're muted. Yes, that's definitely correct, Gene. And, uh, you know, as I was listening to everything you guys were saying in the beginning, you're hitting a lot of the correct points of the things that we do and the things that we should be doing. And, um, you know, even as a renter, some of the things that you could be doing is the garden bed, the raised garden bed, uh, because that is not attached to the renters, to the home. Uh, they even have those ones that are elevated, that are movable. Um, so those are really important. And the composting you could totally do as a renter. And we have residents that independently compost at their home. And then we also have the, the big composting bins that you saw in the video at our gardens. Uh, so those are really important. And just the composting itself, creating that high quality soil will help to make your plants better, uh, more nutritious, and it helps with water conservation because when the soil is that rich, you don't need to water it as much. It retains moisture and it really helps to thrive uh, for the plant. So that, that was really important. Um, another thing, and again, as rent, let me go back to being renters for a minute as the beginning was. Um, yeah, you don't own the place, but there are certain things you can do and you can advocate for those things, especially if you have a really good relationship with your with your uh, landlord. Uh, talk to them about these things. Do you have a low flow toilet, a dual flush toilet? A lot of people do not have that in their homes. And that is so important. Um, as Gene said, this goes back decades at Pilgrim Place, uh, led by the residents, you know, really helped to, to educate on this matter. But going back to 2006 at Pilgrim Place, we reduced our water consumption by 40% just by switching um, to low flow toilets throughout the campus. That's huge on a 32 acre campus with all these uh, residents, 350 and staff and everybody using the restrooms. So that's huge. Um, so yes, maybe you don't have one in your, in your rental, but you can talk to your uh, landlord about that because there will come a time when it needs to be replaced and there's rebates. That's something we didn't talk about earlier is rebates. Um, right now we're getting an amazing turf rebate uh, for doing landscape projects at, at Pilgrim Place. Uh, Wi-Fi sprinkler timers, they're almost getting paid in full. I think we pay about $100 for them now and we're getting a $90 rebate on those. That's amazing and it's so easy to control from your phone and to make sure everything's working correctly. And the toilets are rebates. Um, so, you know, again, have that conversation, maybe educate them and um, if they're willing to, and I'll tell you, the, these dual flush toilets, they're only $100. They're like $120. Um, so it's really not a lot of money uh, to make this happen. And that makes such an impact to have that dual flush toilet. Um, 
Oh yeah, there's uh, something we didn't talk about that's maybe more geared towards homes is the gray water system. And that we, we haven't been seeing that too much, but we do have some residents who use that and it can be beneficial if, if you use it correctly. And that's where the uh, washer, when you use the washer and the plumbing, instead of draining back into the drain, it goes out and waters your plants. But you have to make sure you're using the right kind of soap and, and have that set up correctly. But I know a lot of Claremont residents do have that system. Uh, Ed, can you also talk about um, your uh, other energy efficiency retrofits like uh, and the uh, solar panels that you've installed? Yeah, so uh, energy efficiency in our, in our homes is, is very important. Um, insulation is a big deal, making sure we keep that hot air, that heat out of, out of uh, the house. Um, energy efficient appliances, Energy Star appliances, very energy efficient. Um, HVAC systems, when we do have to replace them, you, you talked about setting your thermostat at 78, that's perfect. Um, you know, really trying to keep it higher, but also having a, a high efficiency energy system. So again, as renters or homeowners, whatever the case, you're gonna have to replace your system sooner or later. Uh, so make sure you do your research and get those 14 or 16 SEER uh, energy efficient systems that really do not use much electricity um, that's a that's something we're doing solar panels as well of course you know because the the peak times are changing edison's changing the peak times and and all that um and we've seen uh those come down in price you know and they really have a re good return on investment for solar panels um let's see what else hey ted I, i've got a question real quick yeah oh go ahead um, sorry um it's one I, I wanted to make one point here that i think is really important um, and it, it back to like, <laughs> just like homeowners, when, when things break, they need to be replaced. And I think, you know, being armed with the knowledge that, you know, these rebates exist and that these, these options exist and they're, they're affordable, right? They're, they're, you know, they're a better deal for the landlord in many cases than, um, right. going with like the traditional thing is really important. So, you know, when our toilet goes or when our AC goes, you know, asking or requesting our landlord makes those changes, I think is part of our responsibility as renters in trying to live more sustainably. Um, when I, I visited the garden before, um, probably a couple months ago now at, at Pilgrim, and one of the things that just like blew me away was the compost setup you guys have. Um, what is, okay, I have a couple, a couple quick questions because I'm so interested in this. One, like, where is that waste coming from? Is that yard clippings? Is that food waste? Is it everyone contributing kind of like our community compost program from their own kitchens? Is it all of the yes. above? And then yes, who manages that? How does that get managed? Uh, it's a relationship between the residents and our staff and grounds. They really work together and it's beautiful. It's a good thing. Um, so we work together and where does the food waste and grass clippings come from? It comes from the community. The residents are, so Gene lives right up the street from uh, one of the compost bins. So he may have one of those little Claremont containers that you keep your food waste in. I know Claremont was selling those for five bucks or giving them away um, to encourage residents to compost. I got one and it's great. Um, and then, so when that's full, he may just go dump it in the compost bin, the larger one, and, and contribute there. So it's really coming from our residents. And then we do have a lot of grass still. Uh, we are making transition, converting the turf, uh, but where we do have grass, you know, all those grass clippings go right into the compost. We do not throw them away. They're not going in the, in the trash or we use them around our fruit trees for um, like a mulch and you know, all that nitrogen uh, goes into the fruit. So that's all good. Uh, so it just really comes from the community. And then from our kitchens, our commercial kitchens, uh, we participate in the Claremont Organic Food Waste Program, which all businesses that have a kitchen should be doing. We've been doing it for several years and it's mandated as of January next year. Uh, so in our three kitchens that we cook, uh, anything like lettuce, bones, uh, anything organic goes in a separate trash can and Claremont comes and picks it up three days a week for us. So Claremont really has a commitment as a city as well to, for um, sustainability and, and all of this um, that we're talking about here. Great, I think Angela has a question, Angela. Yeah, um, the, just as a follow up to that, um, the 
program you're talking about for the city is currently a pilot program. So some residents may not realize that there's a subset of the city's residents who are can participate in that program. It's to help work out the details of the cost structure, um, the scheduling for a mandated program, which will come into effect next year. Um, so we are really happy to see that we at the same time we would love to encourage people to keep their compost local that that the city will come and pick it up for you and that's certainly better than taking it to a landfill but it still goes in a in a vehicle and is trucked miles and miles away and then it's sold to somebody else <laughs> when it could be benefiting your own garden so just keep that in mind um the question I had, uh, there's a couple, one from me is, Ted, you are um, kind of, to me, it seems like maybe in a class of your own in terms of the management of Pilgrim Place and that your knowledge about all of these sustainability issues. Uh, were you um, brought on at Pilgrim Place because of this or how, I, I don't imagine that your knowledge and your approach to managing the property is maybe representative of all senior living communities that are available <laughs> to people. <laughs> so can you tell us how you came to be at Pilgrim Place and did you learn this from the residents or did you bring some of it with you? I, you know, I, I worked in, um, in grounds before, so I kind of have like a little passion for gardening, but I would say seeing the residents passion for this matter and this topic and hearing the education from them has really inspired me uh, to be where I am today and, and to know what I know. Um, so I think the community's kind of rubbed off on me and Thanks. I'm very, very interested in it. And that's, that's how I'll say I'll, I'll learn this and I'm glad to share anything uh, that I learned. And, you know, another thing we didn't talk about was trees. Um, you know, not so much for the renters, but trees play an important role in um, shading your home. Like we have some homes that don't even need to turn on their air conditioning because it's completely shaded and it takes it down 20 degrees. Um, so that that's really important. Um, and then buying products that are recycled. I, I like what you guys said about that, uh, buying recycled products. As you saw, our, our garden beds, they are built with recycled material um, completely. And that's a company out of Oregon that, uh, again, one of the residents referred us to. And so we went that route, you know, it's uh, all sustainable. Great. So some, some members of the, that are participants here tonight are asking, um, and I honestly don't know the answer. Um, and maybe you do, maybe you know some people or Jean, um, do you know if some of the, like, San Antonio Gardens or the Manor, if do you know what's going on there? Have you rubbed off on them by chance? Uh, I don't know the answer. Okay. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, unless we have somebody in the audience who's from another community, you could raise your hand and please feel free. We'll get you unmuted to report because uh, we don't have a pre, you know, somebody representing the other communities here tonight. Um, yeah, Angela, we have another question um, uh, from Bob Hale. Can anyone comment yeah. on induction electric cooking? Um, I know that um, uh, some renters um, are opting for, they have like really great induction cooktops that you could just buy really cheap now and just put them on your gas stove and just not use the gas and have one less utility um, bill. Um, which is an option that we're looking into. Um, Angela or Elise, do you, either of you have induction or are you both on gas stoves? Yeah, unfortunately I am. And that's one of those things like our last week where you have an appliance that is perfectly functional, fairly new, and I can't justify ripping it out. Right. <laughs> and, you know, even though I am a homeowner, um, there's still sunk costs in that that appliance, so I try to you know use it wisely, use it you know and and not waste or anything. But um, the moment we have an opportunity to replace it, we'll be going to electric. Um, and what about 
Oh, sorry. As I say, there's a lot of, um, I, I hope that this will come more into the mainstream. I think it's getting there. Um, education around the health benefits, even if you're um, not convinced or not as concerned about the emissions from your stove, there are really serious um, health exposure to having natural gas burning inside our closed buildings. And we can create pollution levels in our kitchens and in our bedrooms that are would be illegal outside. And this, in an area where we have some of the worst air pollution in the nation on an you know, annual basis. So this people in this region in particular, I hope learn more about that and, and um, look into going to electric for their own health. How about a Pilgrim Place, Jean or, or Ted as induction? Um, one of the things that are offered or is that a transition or, or what's that look like? We have uh, some homes that are, have electric, electric uh, cooktops and there's a growing conversation about making uh, a switch, but at the moment, um, you know, we still have gas appliances like stoves and, um, you know, they're fairly economical for, for your monthly uh, payment compared to electricity, but uh, that conversation started and we're looking into it, yeah. Great, yeah, just on that, um, that topic, uh, I, this is not a plug for the product, but I was just uh, um, marketed online a, a product that you, a little widget you put in your dryer that tells you when your clothes are dry. So if, even if you are using a gas dryer, another way to kind of use less gas and, and just you know, dry as much as you need and then have that resource, you know, tell your smartphone when you could go turn off your dryer because your clothes are, are good. I think there, there are little workarounds too that in the meantime, while our, our you know, stoves are still working or our dryers are still going, um, ways that we could reduce you know, the, the emissions that we're producing. Hey, hey, let's get back to clothing lines and just hang them outside. Mm -hmm. Perfect, exactly, exactly. The sun mm -hmm. is free and clean. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, and in the summer, it's about 10 minutes and they're dry. <laughs> Yep. Sometimes we, we have a clothesline in our yard, and nobody ever complains. Uh, it is unsightly. Yeah. Um, I want to say one word about monitoring. Uh, on water, we have a resident committee that posts on a bulletin board for everyone to see uh, every water meter every month, and with comparison charts month after month, uh, so that we. When, when Ted says there's a reduction in our total water use, uh, we not only know the total, we also know whether my house <laughs> is, is using less. And what's worse, my neighbors know whether my house is. And one of the things that does, of course, is help us to catch and identify leaks that would otherwise have gone unnoticed, underground leaks. But it also... Uh, is a reminder that if somebody has turned on water on a fruit tree and left and then, you know, forgotten to turn it off, um, uh, the uh, community monitoring will catch up with them. Yeah, that's, that's a good thing to do. That's very important. I was thinking about that as Nicole said that she changed the time on her sprinklers because so did I. I noticed it was evaporating too quickly. So I started watering at like 1 a.m., uh, instead of four, because it was it was pointless. It was just drying up. But when your sprinklers irrigation goes off at 1 a.m., you're sleeping and you don't know if there's a broken line or some major uh, water waste concern. And when you wake up, it's dry. So you think everything's okay. Uh, so that monitoring is very important. I, as Jean said, we've, we're chasing leaks um, and really trying to do a good job at that because that's a big concern. I mean, even on the 210 today, I, I don't know who to call, but there's a huge leak on the freeway coming from the, the garden right there on the side. And it's been leaking all day in major water. But who do you call? Oh, that's terrible. Um, um, I called the gas, uh, the water company because I had moved back in here. Um, this was my house I was renting to my daughter and I had a water bill that seemed a little bit high and they can actually look and tell me exactly what time my water was used. 
And we figured out that my daughter, when she reset the sprinkler, she put a time for each circuit and it goes to the first circuit, second, third, fourth. So it was running through four times every morning. And so I thought maybe I had a leak somewhere, but like they can actually say, yeah, from this time to this time, your water was running and you used this much gallons. I just think that's fantastic. That's great. That's a Thanks great like sharing. resource to know. Yeah, that that exists. Uh, Bob also dropped in that drip irrigation that was very effective. Yeah, and that's like another you know, getting around uh, evaporative, you know, waste from sprinklers is another thing. If you can, it's a great thing. And to, it's great uh, for our trees. And it's great for our trees. It, you still have to keep an eye out for leaks, though. I have a drip irrigation system, and I would say a couple times a year. Um, you get a fountain coming out of the ground or evidence of a fountain if you're running your sprinklers and you know the squirrels get into the and chew or or they just spontaneously break so yeah being mindful that you you can't just set it and walk away and, <laughs> um is is important to, st to stay on top of it and to look at your water bill if you if you get your water bill directly or if you're concerned call the golden state water because they'll show you you know wow this is how much you used last year the same month um and so and we've found leaks that way that we didn't otherwise know about just by looking carefully at our water bill right great um it and so I'm trying to see if we missed any questions. Yeah, there's far. a couple. Yeah. Um, someone asked, Jane, Jane asked about vermiculture. Does anyone, do you at um, Pilgrim Place do any vermiculture? Is it kind of just the standard composting? Um, anyone, anyone here with experience? I do not personally, and I know Stuart doesn't. Um, but I think we have a few residents who do that, but we don't do it as a, you know, as a big operation like, like we do with the, the regular composting. But when you asked about, you know, how I got into it, I remember that's one of the first things I did was uh, get like a, one of those worm kits with the composting. And that was my first introduction to composting. Again, that's something you could do if you just have a patio or a balcony. And that's an easy way to get rid, rid of your... Um, your lettuce and watermelon rinds and that kind of stuff. You just toss it in there. And the the worm tea, I'll call it, that comes out of there, wow. You mix that 20 to one and you spray it on your plants and you get some huge growth. We had some chilies and the guys said there was the hottest chilies they ever had. <laughs> uh, but it, it's a fertilizer. It's, it's the uh, worm secretions or whatever, but uh, wow, very potent. And you can use it full strength in a spray bottle to kill your weeds coming through your concrete and stuff. Excellent. Yeah. So I, I would recommend that. And I think the kit was like $50 to get started. And uh, it really starts growing. And it's very simple. It's very simple. You could keep it on your patio or somewhere off to the side. And it doesn't bother anything. And it's a great thing. It seems like something oh. ripe for a, a dialogue, a community dialogue on composting and vermiculture. And I'd love to see that because I got my kit years ago and it was working great at a previous resident and I've killed two batches of worms so far and I don't know how I'm killing them. Yeah, they, they, there are certain things that they don't do well, certain types of food from what I understand. Yeah, I maybe temperature. What I'm doing wrong, yeah. and it might be the moisture level. But then I had read that it needs sand, and I put a little sand in there. But the sand may have originally came from the beach, because it was here from you know my daughter had brought it. So I may have salted my worms. I'm not, oh. sure. but I've got another batch. I have a friend who has way too many worms, so I just got another batch, and I'm working on it. But if we have a vermiculture series, I would love to join in. Yeah, they're more, they're, they take a little bit more care, I think, than kind of your standard compost bin where you really can almost throw anything in there. And, um, mm -hmm. and it, if you kill your compost bin or like slow it down, it tends to just rebound with time. <laughs> um, yeah. Whereas worms, that you, they can really just go away. <laughs> But and may not come it, back on but the own. eggs can come back in a month but i don't know if i knew what killed it in the first place yeah I don't know if it's going to kill the eggs i yeah. don't know we're working on it 
um, I think that um, there was a question early on, and I know since we're talking about gardening and stuff about pests and all of those beautiful beds at Pilgrim Place, um, and Tony or Ted, sorry, you wrote back, um, but you don't have trouble with pests coming in and harvesting all of your <laughs> beautiful um, vegetables. A, a little bit. It, it's to, I've seen minimal activity from like, yeah, the larger pests like squirrels and possums and things like that. It happens, but I, we try to do mitigation by putting those uh, wire cages around them. And, and things like that. And it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, the squirrels are happy with all the fruit trees and everything else around campus and uh, the rabbits and everybody else. So. There's enough to go around. There's enough to go around, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Hey, Angela, um, I'm gonna switch gears for just a quick second here sure. and then we could come back to any remaining questions. Um, but we do have um, Alex here who has some sort of things that we could do, behavior changes that we could start tonight. And, and he's um, here to kind of lay out a couple of those for us. So again, that we could just get going on this and, and, and live more sustainably. Alex, you there? Yeah, I'm right here. All right, it's all your... All right, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Alex Garibay. I'm with Southern California Edison. And just for a quick background, um, my role is um, I work with community-based organizations that are uh, represent uh, different underserved communities. And these communities are low income, uh, senior, disabled, um, access functional needs as well, um, as well as those hard to reach areas. And the objective of, of these partnerships with these um, organizations or CBOs as we refer to them, is to help Edison provide uh, information and, and educate our communities, right? So a lot of great information that everybody was sharing. And you know, I was taking notes on some of the tips uh, I know Elise was talking about some of the, the Facebook groups that are available, I think, buy, buy nothing. Hopefully, I'm not, I'm not messing it up. Uh, so while I was, you know, just listening to you guys, I actually joined a couple of them here by the house, and I just saw some great uh, things that were just coming up. Um, so it's all about sharing, right? And, and first of all, I just want to commend all of you, just uh, the way everyone just kind of shares what they're doing and how they can um, continue to make an impact in, in an environment, right? So I hope with the information that I'll share with you today, I add value to, to the amazing conversation that, that you guys have ongoing. So um, obviously we're, we're going into our warmer weather uh, time of the year, right? Um, so one of the things we, we, we look at is, you know, what are the tips or what suggestions can we give to our customers to help them save energy? Um, obviously, you know, I think, you know, given our current environment with, with COVID have been around for um, almost over a year, um, it changes things a little bit, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of us are still working from home. Uh, so we are still using more energy than we would normally do. I know myself, I am, uh, you know, obviously right now kids are on, on summer break, but uh, for a good portion of the year, kids were also at home. They were doing their online classes. So again, more energy was being used. So, you know, obviously use this to your discretion. Um, you know, and some of the tips, tips that I can just give you off the bat, and, and I can't remember who mentioned this, uh, barely touched on it, so I'm gonna piggyback off of that is, you know, just finding ways to change your your behavior throughout the day and, and the way that you use energy. And what I mean by that is, you know, the recommendation from Edison is that you use your appliances or anything that uses most energy uh, off peak, during off-peak hours. And what does that mean? So off-peak hours are either before 4 p.m. or after 9 p.m. So what does that look like in, in the everyday, right? Um, so, you know, if you're an individual that's at home during the day, uh, and if you, you know, and I know we're talking about the, the rental segment. So some rental properties allow for washer and dryer, some don't, I, I totally understand that. Uh, but if you do have a, a washer dryer appliance in, in, your, in your home or your apartment, you know, preferably using them in the, in the earlier part of the day, because that's when you're, you, the, the energy is, is, is during the off peak. Uh, the thermostat, I think that's one of the things we've all been hearing, right? And not just through Edison, but when we hear, um, you know, infomercials or commercials from Energy Upgrade California, is just setting your thermostat during the day so that you're adapting and your home is cooler in the evening. Uh, one of the things that I personally do is um, I have my thermostat, you know, to cool, in, to cool the place off during the day. Um, and I keep my blinds closed to just, you know, block the heat from coming in. And I found that that, that, that has helped a lot. 
Um, you know, other things that you can do is, you know, if you're, you know, a, a person that likes to read, uh, turning off, you know, as much as lights possible and just keeping that lamp on while you're doing your reading. Uh, so again, it's just doing certain behaviors, right? Uh, changing our behavior. And one of the things that we have, and, and I'll drop the link on the chat when I finish uh, sharing the information, uh, we do have a page in Edison uh, that gives you just tips to save energy and money. And it, it goes more into depth in terms of, of what I talked about. And then we also have another great site that um, it's, it's energy solutions from your home. Um, and if you're an Edison customer and if you have an account set up on sc.com, you're able to go in there, take a survey. And then what the system will do is it will take uh, analyze your data for the past. I think you have to have been a customer for uh, 11 months at least. And it'll just give you options in terms of are you on the right rate? What does that mean? So the way I like to describe being on the right rate is, you know, I'll age myself here is if you recall when cell phones, you know, started coming out, I'm referencing, I think, 99, 98. At that time, you could select a cell phone plan that would allow you to use a plan that accommodated your lifestyle. Meaning if you were an individual that was talking on the phone a lot during the day, you can pick a plan to be able to use those minutes and not pay a lot for those minutes. Or if you were one that used more minutes in the evening, then you can adapt that, right? So our rate options is the same concept. Uh, the, what the website will do is it'll say, Alex, here's your energy usage for the past 11 months. Based on this behavior, we can recommend that you can actually be on a different rate plan and actually save a um, hundred or $150 within uh, 11 months moving forward. Uh, so I'll go ahead and share that information. Uh, when you go to the website, if there is an in-language need, we do have our websites available in Spanish, uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, and, and Korean. You just, as soon as you go on the website, you go to the upper right-hand corner and it'll give you a drop-down menu where you can select uh, the different language. Um, and then, that's how you can change your, your, how you can make an immediate impact, right? But if we were to look at the long term, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I like to call out when I have the opportunity to speak with an audience like you guys tonight is understanding that the impacts of COVID are going to be here for a while. Uh, even though we're seeing, you know, the mass mandate being lifted, you know, places opening up, uh, everybody's at Dodger Stadium. Um, you know, there are still people that are struggling and, you know, they're in a situation where they've got to figure out, okay, with the money that I have, am I going to pay my utilities or am I going to pay my groceries? Uh, so we understand that. So, uh, you know, I want to highlight that, you know, for medicine, we are here to work with you. Uh, there's different opportunities to, you know, help you through this financial hardship or someone that you may know. Uh, we have programs available that can help with that, which are our rebate programs. Uh, these programs have been here before COVID, and they're going to continue to be here after COVID. And the programs are, you know, if with income guidelines, if you qualify, you can receive up to a 30% discount on your electric bill. Uh, we also have a program for individuals that have medical equipment at home. We call this our medical baseline program. And this program, um, obviously, if, if someone has a, a machine at home that they need for medical reasons, it's obviously running a lot, right? So guess what? It's using a lot of energy. By applying to this program, number one, you've identified that you're an individual that has medical equipment at home. So in the event of a, a power shutoff or a wildfire activity, we know that we need to make sure you're okay. The other part is that, you know, we can put you on a rate where you're not paying, you're paying a lower price for your energy, given that you have a medical condition. Um, and then another program that we have available, and I know with uh, when you're when you're renting, because I've rented myself, it's, you know, sometimes you get the appliances, sometimes you got to provide your own appliances, but we have a program that's, uh, it's called our ESA program. And obviously it's based on applying and income guidelines, but you can actually qualify to have um, all the appliances, appliances, excuse me, that use a lot of energy and get them replaced for more energy efficient appliances. Um, I know I had a, I have an aunt and when I told her about this program, when I started working in this team a couple of years ago, you know, I, I told as many people as I could, cause it's, 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 it's free of charge. You don't get, you don't have to pay to get these appliances changed. I said, Hey, you know, we have this program and I know you have this refrigerator in the garage. Um, and I think a lot of us know that those people that have an extra fridge, which is cool. She's like, well, you know, I've had this fridge since, you know, since you and your cousins were little and, you know, the sentimental value, but I'm like, yeah, but you know how much energy that's using? 
Um, so finally, we convinced her to to part ways with it and and separate, you know, the sentimental part of it. And she was able to get a, a new refrigerator that was more energy efficient. Now you're not gonna get a a two sided stainless steel uh, circle ice cube with you know all the works, but um, it is an appliance to help you change your uh, to help you just consume less energy and still be able to serve the needs that you have. Um, so again, I'm gonna drop a few links um, on the chat that will be very beneficial to you. Um, you know, this is my first time um, speaking to you guys and, and meeting Stuart obviously th through online, uh, but I really wanna carry this, this conversation, provide support, um, you know, just hearing everything you guys are doing from, you know, recommendations on where you can go to, to, to do your recycle on how you can change your behavior, uh, the Facebook groups that are available, you know, let me know how I can be a partner. And, you know, I don't, and Stuart, this invitation goes out to you and the team. Uh, please it's, don't see it as a one-time thing, unless everybody tells you we don't like Alex the way he spoke, so don't invite him back again. No, um, this is, but if, uh, but, you know, I really want to continue partnering up with you guys and, and just keeping you up to date on a lot of information because, you know, as I manage this program and get to know the communities, there's a, there's, for lack of a better term, and I do not mean any disrespect by this, there's a desperate need for information on how we can change our behavior and put some money back in our pockets. Everyone's been impacted by COVID in some way, shape, or form. I have those resources. I can get those out to you through the proper channels. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to add you guys to my distribution list. So, uh, with that said, um, any questions that came up on the chat or any questions that anybody wants to ask on the call, I'll be more than happy to uh, take those. Yeah, so Alex, we did get one question, somebody who wanted to get in contact with you, and I already sent you an email, um, um, but I, I need to get, is Janet or Jane, um, Jane, if you could, oh, never mind, um, excuse me, Jane, your email's in there, and, and I sent you her comment and her email, so maybe if you could get in touch with Jane, that would be great. Um, Will do. We are, we are running out of, time, uh, out of time here, and Angela, I think you have one question, and then yeah. I'm going to kind of take over from there, if that works. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, Definitely two com one comment and then a question that we we didn't get to earlier. Um, take advantage of um, the website and now certainly we have a real person from SCE here um, that could help direct your questions to the right people. Um, in last week's presentation, our Green Home Tour, we had a you know our residents talking about sometimes you don't know the right question to ask your contractor or your landlord or whatever about what's available. So you don't get you don't get the right answer. So for example, um, they, they were needing to replace their HVAC and they didn't know that there are electric heat pump super efficient models out there. And so, you know, you don't necessarily know what to look for. They may not be on the showroom floors at Lowe's. <laughs> um, so SCE um, and other, um, you know, organizations can help educate us on what's coming and the, the latest and greatest efficiency. You know, EPA's website, Energy Star, is a great um, place to look for, for good information. Um, the question now doesn't have anything to do with energy. We're going to jump back to gardening real quick. Um, the, uh, yeah. Induction electric cooktops are a good example, Bob Hill, of things that are out there that are not the mainstream yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and you can get rebates and, and they're just more efficient, a lot of these things. So we have to educate ourselves and each other. Um, and Angela, real quick, if I may just add, um, and yeah. everyone, again, uh, thank you for, for allowing me to, to share this information with you. Um, I know that we put a, Stuart put a link to a survey on the on the chat. So if you have some, a couple of times to spare, just we would really appreciate your feedback on the information. And it also helps us just tailor information as we move forward. So uh, thank you, Angela, I'll give it back to you. Great. Um, so with all the conversation about gardening and, and growing food and trying to keep things local and buying as little as, we have to. Um, the question was, does anyone know if there are gardeners exchanges um, in the community? And if not, um, 
beyond what Pilgrim's doing with their sale of plants, I know at your festival, but maybe Jean, you wanna talk about that a little bit. Um, if we could talk about um, Gardner's exchanges a little November bit. November 12th and 13th, and we're gonna do it real live, we think this year, thank Great. God. Yeah. And then there's also the Sustainable Claremont we have a, a gardening group um, that is also a community of gardeners um, here in Claremont. They have not been meeting obviously for the last year, but hopefully before the end of this year, they'll get back into uh, monthly meetings. So that's a great source to network with people who are serious about gardening, not necessarily just growing food. It's gardening of all types. And of course we have the um, California Botanic Garden, which is a great source of um, information and experts on gardening and gardening with native plants. Anyone else have anything to add? Um, I will add there is a Claremont Area Gardeners Facebook page group that I just recently found. So you maybe we'll be able to connect with people on there. I also know that the um, Pomona Farmers Market, they have a seed exchange booth. So you can go and pick up seeds from people who have donated them locally, and then in turn donate your own seeds to help others in the community. And then buy nothing as well. You could definitely post on there if you wanna share or ask for plants. I'm sorry, um, I think Nicole sorry. gets paid by buy nothing. Somebody uh, <laughs> is lighting fireworks. Um, yeah. Actually, just last week, I asked for some herb cuttings because um, I wanted to propagate them. And within an hour, I had six different types of herb cuttings and some chive seeds that I had picked up. So definitely yeah. a good group to join. Well, there's I know. Also, go ahead. Sorry. There's also a website called Falling Fruit. Mm -hmm. And it... Uh, and you can uh, search for your area and it lets you know the, uh, the fruit trees that are growing uh, that have extra fruit that you can go pick. Right, and that's what uh, someone, Jennifer, from our audience tonight um, shared that Uncommon Good, the organization we've mentioned a couple of times tonight, you can call them and they will come and pick your oranges or your lemons or whatever you know, you have growing in excess and um, get it to the community. Um, it's called gleaning. They'll come and, and, or you can bring it to them if you wanna go shopping at their store and bring your excess um, food so that it does not go to waste. That's a great thing. Check hey. them out. They're on off of um, Foothill, near Indian Hill and Foothill. Right by our office. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you so much. We're we're just about, about you know out of time here, so I just wanted to take the last few minutes to make a couple of comments. Um, this is obviously our, our first green home tour, and it's not how we envisioned it when we started planning it like two and a half years ago. Um, and and we're really hopeful that next year we'll all be in person, and we'll have a couple of open houses, and we'll be able to talk to one another. Um, and really have that more personal interaction um, to have these important conversations so that we could all really live more sustainably and, and hear about all these great resources. Um, but in spite of the, that challenge, I think that we've had a really great um, last four weeks, including tonight, and that this is all you know, helpful in that incremental change that we're all trying to make. So I, I did just really want to thank everyone tonight. Ted, I'm so glad he came on, and Gene, you had so much great information to offer, and of course, Elise and Nicole. And then the, the past three weeks when we talked to Becky and Christine and we talked to Sorrel and Chris and we talked to Peter Okoye about his, his net zero um, house, just so much great information that we, we, we learned over the past four weeks. Um, also wanted to thank Eddie G who, who did all the videos for these, who did like an amazing job. He's the little video guru for, um, for Claremont Heritage and for us and a lot of other little local CBOs. So big thanks to him, to our Green Home Tour Planning Committee. And then last to, to Angela, my colleague, who's got four more days, three more days, we're counting down the hours here at SC and has been like such an instrumental partner in all this and planning it and running it from behind the scenes. So I just wanted to 
to thank you, Angela. Um, I thank everybody for, for coming tonight. Um, and let's, let's hope to see everyone in person this time next year. So thank you all again. Check out our website for all these resources that'll be available and we'll see you later. Thanks everyone. Thanks Angela. Thanks everybody. Thank you, thank you all. Have a great evening. Thanks Gene. Thank you. Everyone. Everyone. Thanks Place. Gene. Yeah. You. Thanks Gene. Your inspiration. Awesome. Yeah. Everyone. Ted, I'm going to chase down your email. And Alex, I left out your name. I'm so sorry. Alex, thank you for all your help too. And we'll get all those resources distributed to everybody. Yeah, uh, we'll share. Um, I, I sent a message to Alex. I don't know if he, did he, does his email get shared directly? Um, you know, I'm not sure. Group? I'm not sure, but we could do a follow-up in the Green Home Tour Resource Guide. Okay. Or on the website. website. Great. Okay, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care.